Hello everyone, Hyper here, and welcome to the Big Dumb Strats video for Mythic Zakul. I am joined by Lozi, the GM of BDG, to talk about tanking, and Shampi, the unnerfed healing officer of BDG, Disc Reist expert, and solo healer of Argus, to of course share some healing insight. If you have any feedback or questions, make sure to leave it in the comments section, or you can also join my Discord, which is linked in the description box below. I hope this video helps you guys out. So let's get started. The first section of this video will again be the general strategy breakdown. To start off with, your general raid comp should be 2 tanks, 4 healers and an assortment of DPS, preferring passive cleave classes like on Orgozoa and classes with strong single target burst cooldowns who are very good in the Delirium Realms. There are a few changes from Heroic to Mythic that you should be aware of before even starting this boss. One of the bigger changes is that you will now have three tentacles spawn instead of one. And especially in early progress, this mechanic will probably be the biggest source of deaths in your raid. And it takes a while for people to get used to how to dodge these. The second change being that Dark Pulse is replaced by Psychotic Split in the later phases. And this will require your raid to kill a unique add in both the Fear and the Delirium realms separately. And I will talk more about this and how you should assign DPS cooldowns for it in the DPS section. And lastly, Thelicera no longer exists, so the only way to travel from Fear to the Normal Realm or Reality is via Summoners or by Dying. That being said, before you even pull the boss, you should set up Delirium Groups. The general strategy is to never assign a combination where players might kill each other, uh, a great example for this is Fire Mage and any melee. That's a huge combination that you need to avoid. We tend to prefer ranged DPS to go down into the Delirium Realms because there's less sources of error, because you have more room to move around, dodge tentacles, and move away from the AoE effects. For Delirium 1, you want to assign Shadow Priest because you want them to stay in here kind of a long time, but this is also one of the less impactful Deliriums. For number two, which is probably the least important one, you will want to have mages. And this group will typically only spend about 3-4% to in this realm, maybe a little longer. And this is just to help you push the boss to 50%. Delirium 3 is where it gets important, because this is where you get your first psychotic split. So for here, it's important that you assign at least one Shadow Priest, who will essentially help uh, the raid deal with the small adds. And then you want to assign the rest of the spots to strong cooldown classes that do strong single target damage. So Warlocks, Rogues, Boomkins, and Hunters are all great choices for this. Delirium 4 again is an important one because you get a Psychotic Split. But here you don't really need a Shadow Priest as much because it doesn't overlap with adds spawning on the outside. So you just need single target focus damage. And again, Locks, Rogues, Boomkins, and Hunters are all great choices. For Delirium 5, which is the last one if you use our strategy, you just want to assign strong Execute classes, and again, preferably ranged. Because here, Mages get very strong, and again, if you assign Mages, you can't assign Melee. So Mages and Shadow Priests are great choices for the very last one. One thing to note is that Delirium 3 and 4 teams need to be able to survive a little bit longer after they kill their ad, And this is because you want the Dark Passage cast to go off before they come up to the normal realm. Otherwise, they will spawn summoners. And we'll touch on this in a later section. So to talk a little bit about the mythic version of the tentacle mechanic, you should always go counterclockwise and know that they can spawn at any point in the room. So you can preemptively predict where the tentacles will appear before they actually show their animation. They will show a flash on the opposite side of where the tentacles will spawn. So if you see the flash first, you know that the tentacles will appear on the opposite side of the room. So one thing to know about the tentacles is once they have all spawned and the first tentacle will play its animation, the first slap isn't a real one and it can't hurt you, but the second one is actually real and will kill you. Another thing to note about tentacle dodging is you can stand between tentacles 1 and 2 or 2 and 3 and you won't get hit. And then once the previous tentacle is finished with its animation, you can just move into where it was. 
And then finally, while it is easy to just follow the boss and not pay attention to where the tentacles spawn, make sure you're always looking out for when the tentacles spawn and paying attention to where they've spawned and just putting yourself in the appropriate position. Another thing to really pay attention to, on, especially on Mythic difficulty, is the Manifest Nightmare mechanic. Because the Nightmare Pools cannot be seen by players in the Delirium Realm, but it can still damage them. So our rule of thumb is to always drop the Nightmare Pools as close to the edge of the room as possible to avoid cutting people off or forcing them to move through puddles. And the people in the, the Delirium Realm will always know where those pools are likely to be. So the timings of this fight are kind of finicky, but once you understand them, they're generally consistent. So our strategy is formed around having consistent and optimal dread timings. So for phase one, you want to stop TPS at around 87.5% on Zakul's health, and then you want to push after the tentacle cast. That should happen after dread two, around one minute and 30 seconds into the fight. If you push at different timings, it can cause mechanics to happen at slightly different rates from one pull to the next. And you might have more or less time to get to the eruptions and the summoners may spawn at different timings before Manic 1, for example. As far as pushing the boss to 50%, you have a little bit more of a lenient timing, but you should push around 3 minutes and 30 seconds so that you can get a consistent Dread 4 timing. If this transition happens too late, you'll get kind of bad mechanic overlaps. Phase 4 is slightly different than the other phases, and the strategy of the first half requires a little more explanation than the first three. When the first summoners spawn, you only need to go down after the first manic goes off, and only two of these summoners need to die. Generally, it's the one that the tanks use to go to the fear realm, and whichever one is near the eruption that they have to pull it towards shortly after. Do not touch the third summoner for the time being, just keep killing the adds that it spawns. From here, you just handle mechanics regularly, keep dodging tentacles until you kill the first split add. After that, there will be a manic. After this manic, most of your raid will have accumulated a decent number of hysteria stacks. In order to drop these stacks, everyone must return to reality for a brief period of time. However, there is an unintuitive interaction in this fight that can be exploited here. If there is no one alive in reality, and the boss casts Dark Passage, that set of summoners will not spawn. You're going to have to use boss mods or weak aura to track when Dark Passage gets cast. It's an instant cast that's buys a cool, so you'll never see a cast bar. There'll be no visual indicator for it in the game world. But after it has been cast, everyone is safe to leave their realms, both Fear and Delirium, and to come back to reality. The raid only wants to stay in reality long enough to drop their stacks. During this time, things get pretty hectic. Tanks will have to move the boss to the eruption. Uh, tentacles will be going on. Adds generally also get out of control here. So there should be emphasis on killing those and keeping those numbers down. Also, since the entire raid is moving, everyone needs to be extra mindful of their positioning and health throughout this. This is one of the sketchiest parts of the fight in terms of deaths as well. Once the stereo stacks have been dropped, the entire raid can go back down to fear, minus whoever is on your delirium team. And the first thing you need to do is kill that summoner as soon as possible. It's going to be fairly close to completing its cast, and if the cast goes off, it deals very large raid damage. From here on out, the fight gets a little simpler. The entire raid will just stay in fear. The one caveat to this is you want to soulstone a healer that can die after the second split so they can assist people who get knocked back up to reality. Shamans could onk this instead of using a soulstone. There also is an alternative strategy for the first half of the fight. Instead of holding DPS, you can burn through most of these DPS checks as long as you can push to 50% by about 245. What this does is it essentially removes a dread from the fight but gives you the same timings on the second half of the fight going forward. Uh, if you are going to do this, and you can push the boss to 70% before the third set of tentacles, you'll save yourself some bad mechanic overlaps as well. Due to the high amount of damage required and the volatility of this strat, we don't recommend it, but did want to throw it out there if people were interested in trying it. Next, let's talk about the DPS strategy for this fight. The first two phases are very straightforward. The first phase will last about 2 minutes, so all classes who have cooldowns that are either 2 minutes or longer than 2 minutes should just hold them for the first Punctured Darkness. 
This is because in the first phase, you need to stop DPS anyway. So allowing classes with lower cooldowns like a minute and 30 seconds and allowing your melee who need to be stacking their corals and their ink pods on the boss to do a little bit more damage and have more uptime on the boss will actually benefit your raid more overall even though the people who hold their cooldowns might feel like their damage is being wasted. The first puncture darkness will be at around 2 minutes and 10 seconds depending on how you push the boss. And then from here on out, each puncture darkness will be about a minute apart from each other. Uh, for some of them, it's going to be a tiny bit more than a minute. For some of them, it can be up to a minute and a half, depending on how your fight timings work out. This means that you should be holding your cooldowns for puncture darknesses, unless you're assigned to go down into the delirium to deal with the ad, or you're a class who really helps clean up the small ads during the fight. There are two very specific lust timings that you can use on Mythic Zakul depending on your raid's DPS. With the first one being during the first puncture. You should only be lusting during the first puncture if your raid is struggling a little bit to push the boss to 50% in time. Now the second bloodlust you can use is in phase 4 whenever the boss does the third puncture darkness. So to give you an idea when this happens it's right after going down to the set of summoners in that phase, you deal with the first summoner and as you move over to the second, you will get the puncture darkness and you can hit bloodlust. So again, this is the third puncture darkness of the fight and the boss should be sub 50%. This is a great point to bloodlust if you can make that uh, DPS check to 50% without it, because here you will have a bunch of small ass to deal with and the boss will be taking extra damage. So it's just a very efficient bloodlust to use. Now a little bit about the small ads on Mythic. Just like on Heroic, you have 60 seconds to kill each ad. But on Mythic, this will pose a much bigger challenge than on Heroic because the ads have more health and you also need to be focusing damage into the boss to make sure that you hit these specific timings. If an ad transforms, it more than likely means that you will be wiping, unless it happens at the end of the fight where you can kind of squeak by and still kill the boss. If an ad turns orange, it means that you need to be killing it pretty soon or it will be transforming. Having some of your DPS who deal a lot of ad damage actually track the debuff on the nameplate, uh, it's called Gathering Nightmare, will be extremely useful because they're able to call out which ad is about to transform soon, which ad needs to be focused a little more. Since these ads don't really hit that hard, as a melee DPS, you can always just taunt one in if it's kind of lingering on the outside, maybe hitting a healer. Um, or if you have death knights, you can always grip them into melee because it's important to stay on top of these adds. If you ever fall behind, it is very likely that you're going to have one transform just because you lose track of how many there are. And there's a few points in this fight, most notably whenever you get a fresh wave of summoners, where adds will be a higher priority than hitting the boss. For Delirium teams 3 and 4, who have to deal with Echoes, it is important that they have an exact timing of how to go down, when to go down, and how to hold their cooldowns for it. The general rule of thumb is that Delirium teams want to stay up in the normal realm or in reality and not follow the raid down into the fear realm. And whenever the boss is at 75 energy, they go down to their assigned Delirium. This is so you prevent getting extra stacks of Hysteria, which can mean that you will actually end up coming up from Delirium too early and cause the raid to spawn summoners. So you want to make sure that whenever you go down, you have no stacks of Hysteria for Deliriums 3 and 4. Also, these classes or the people assigned to go down and deal with the Echoes need to make sure that they have DPS cooldown saved because obviously if you miss the DPS check and you don't kill the Echo in time, it means an instant wipe. Now the last tip for people assigned to Delirium, you need to be mindful of your Hysteria stacks regardless of the Delirium you're assigned to. Immunities such as Cloak and Ice Block can help you by dropping the debuff. And depending on which um, number you're assigned to, you might either want to do this before going down to Delirium or after coming up whenever you're obviously at higher stacks. Now some general tips for essences. Purification protocol rank 3 as a minor can be quite good on several classes to help with the small ads. 
Also along these lines, focusing Iris Major can be very beneficial for ad control. So if your class is already good with this essence, and you're kind of struggling a little bit with ads at specific points in the fight, having one or two people take major focusing Iris can help out quite a lot. Uh, the general damage intake on this fight will not be very severe on the DPS. However, about every minute, whenever the dreads come out, if you're using our strategy, you will take a huge spike of damage. So having any kind of absorb applied to you through defensive cooldowns or damage reduction will greatly ensure that you don't die during these dreads. So now we'll cover the healing section. In terms of healing comp, you pretty solidly want four healers. There isn't much healing to be done on this fight, but you want to have enough healers so that you can keep tanks topped up and deal with the timings where there is a relevant amount of damage going out on the raid. To make this fight as easy as possible, you want healers who have DR cooldowns, namely Disc Priests and Holy Pallies. The main two mechanics on this fight for healers to pay attention to are Dreads and the Stacking Hysteria Dot. So first, let's talk about the Dread mechanic. Despite Zakul's timings varying based on push timings, as long as you maintain those consistent push timings that we talked about earlier, you should see consistent Dread timings as well. For what we consider to be the standard timings, you should get Dreads at 15 seconds, 1 minute and 30 seconds, and 2 minutes and 45 seconds. And then your first Manic Dread or Dread 4 should be at roughly 3 minutes and 50 seconds, depending on push timing. And the final two Dreads should always occur immediately after the Psychotic Splits. So to handle that Dread mechanic, we opt to assign significant DR cooldowns and use a Shaman's Tremor Totem to instantly dispel those fears. And the purpose for that is so that nobody gets feared into any dangerous positioning. And you might as well, assuming your raid can live the explosion, because it's just going to be strictly more optimal, especially for DPS. So just to live those Manic Dreads, you're going to need roughly about 30% extra effective HP on each raid member so that they can live all four bursts. And ideally, you want a little more than that so that they don't immediately die to the Hysteria Dot right after. If you don't have enough DRs to make it so that everyone lives through those Dreads consistently, you can instead opt to dispel one fear at a time and use throughput cooldowns and then dispel the next fear and so on and so forth. So in terms of where to assign which DRs to which dreads, the main consideration that I make is for dread 4 or manic dread 1, you want to have cooldowns that allow players to be spread out, such as shout and aura mastery. They don't have to be stacked for those. And the reason for that is so that the players who take those manic dread soaks down to the delirium realm won't accidentally take two soaks when they're getting down there. Uh, additionally, you should combine cooldowns that require people to be stacked together. So Barrier and Link, you want to put those together. And then outside of that Dread mechanic, the other main mechanic for you to think about as healers is Hysteria. You should aim to assign your throughput cooldowns to the timings where you have high stacks. That's usually about 3 minutes to 3 minutes and 20 seconds, and then about 5 minutes to 5 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, the most dangerous timing of those being at roughly 3 minutes, since people are going to be moving, and you're going to have high stacks, and people are going to be coming out of Delirium Realm. And also you're building up to the first Manic Dread as those Hysteria Dots time out. And then finally, for some specific tips for healing this fight, if you have multiple Holy Pallies, just know that there is a bug with Diva Aura where you are unable to benefit from two Diva Auras at the same time. So instead, you should have one Pally take Aura of Sac. Additionally, if you only have one Pally, I would recommend that they take Aura of Sac as well. Um, with both Aura of Sec and Unbreakable Spirit talented, one pally can solo both Dread 1 and Dread 4 with no other cooldowns, which is pretty ideal. So you can and should rely on every raid-wide DR that you can get your hands on, including Warrior Shouts, Demon Hunter Darkness, and even, if you have a prop pally, Aegis. If you're lacking in the DR department, uh, Mistweaver Monks can effectively solo a Dread set as well. The way you would do that is you have your co-healers dispel two of the Dreads, and then you rip a Revival, and it works effectively like a DR would. For Shamans, uh, combining your Spear Link with a Demon Hunter Darkness is usually, on most fights, a very strong combo, but I would not rely on that for this fight to get you through a Dread set. Instead, you want to separate them and put like a, a Spear Link with a Barrier and a Darkness with some other DR cooldown. For the last section of this video, we're going to talk about tips specific to tanking. This fight has two very rigid tank rules. You have one boss tank and one ad control tank. The boss tank is responsible for positioning and movement of Zakul, 
where your ad control tank is responsible for trying to get ads into Melee, um, also primarily being in range of Mind Tether. If any ad does transform, it's worth noting that a Melee is for shadow damage, and a Melee is extremely hard. But as the ad control tank, all you really need to do is taunt a bunch of ads and stay on top of your main tank. Doesn't really matter who takes the echo of fear when it spawns. Doesn't really hit that hard, but it does melee extremely fast when it spawns. So just make sure none of your DPS gets slapped. This fight is solo tankable with a monk, but I wouldn't recommend it. The ad control that the second tank brings far outweighs the damage that you probably don't need at this point anymore. That being said, if you do have access to a Brewmaster, I would highly recommend using one to be your boss tank, even if it is an off-spec player. Using a monk reduces damage taken overall by a ton. This is due to how Mind Tether works post hotfix. It only reflects damage of melees after they've been mitigated. And since monks either dodge melees or stagger reduces them by a lot, this cuts out a lot of damage compared to not using a monk in that role. There's only a few times you need to move the boss, but they're all very important. One is when summoners spawn, you ideally want the boss to be in clear range of a summoner at all times. Boss damage matters a ton in this fight, and any cleave will give your DPS less uptime on adds and more uptime on the boss. Each maddening eruption that spawns will require a boss movement as well. You can move towards all of them right away as soon as it's safe, except for the second one of the fight. This will be in the middle of Phase 3, around Dread 3. We'll talk more about it in a second. Third is just to move for tentacles. Just pick a direction and go. Most of your raid is going to be blindly following where you move the boss, even though they shouldn't be doing it, so try not to second-guess yourself. There are two specific times in this fight when things get chaotic. As mentioned before, around that third dread, you kind of have to deal with all of the abilities back to back to back. So you have to wait out the dread. An eruption will spawn all the way across the room. The next two boss abilities will be tentacles and delirium portals. It is your job as the boss tank to get the boss into a position that your delirium team can go down without getting hit by tentacles while still being close enough to the eruption. After this delirium finishes channeling, you'll probably only have about three to five seconds to get the boss into the eruption. And if you're too far away, it just won't make it. And this will happen. It's just something that you got to get used to. The second chaotic spot is when you have to leave fear in phase four. Generally, you'll also only have about three to five seconds to get to that eruption afterwards. If this is all the way across the room, you're at risk of dying just from being out of range. Just be extra mindful of your HP here overall. Try to keep adds in melee. One of the ways you can mitigate this a little bit is by ending your first split about 180 degrees from wherever your last summoner is up, since eruptions always spawn on the opposite side of the room from where the boss is. This isn't exact, but this will give you about a 10-yard leeway instead of 40 or 50. Thank you so much for watching this video. Really hope the information in it helped you progress this boss further. And if you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comments or you can also join my Discord. Huge thanks to Shampi and Lozi for helping me out with this video. Make sure to check out their Twitter and Twitch, which are linked in the description box. And I'll see you guys on the next one.